chicks first week and we we use those um in our first week brooder that they quickly become way too small for chicks unless you're only raising a few chicks at a time we raise 40 chicks at a time and so you would need a whole lot of those um, in order for everyone to get something to drink so they graduate to the bigger plastic one that, that they hold like a gallon right? these are a gallon yeah it's and a these one are, gallon these size. are a quart yes um, and so the one gallon one does very well for our um, one week old through um, two, to two to three weeks old. And then at four weeks, we add a second one. Um, so that's how we do it. And then you're also going to need feeders. Um, when we first started, we had the blue feeder in the middle, as well as um, a few of the, the long rectangular feeders on the left and they were sitting we tried having them sitting on the chips and they got full of chips and so then we put them on plywood and they got full of chips so <laughs> we decided that they were not a good um way to go and we we, can, we we built new brooders and we have hanging feeders so we use the hanging feeders with the exception of our one week chicks the, the very first week oops how do we go back, go back. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> the very first week, they still get the rectangular um, feeder that's on the left, except we take the lid off. So it just sits on the chips and the teeny tiny little fuzz balls do just fine with those because they can actually walk in them and get their food. Um, once they graduate to um, the our full-size brooders, then the hanging ones work a lot better. Um, because we can raise them as the birds grow and they don't get, they don't kick all the chips in and keep the feed from um, coming down. Okay. One word of caution, <laughs> that little hook that's at the top that they hang from, they Foster. will remove that wing nut, guarantee you. So you'll need a stash of wing nuts and you'll need some bailing twine because you can't buy those wing nuts with that handy dandy little loop at the top. Um, uh, so we use bailing twine and that works. We, we keep a, uh, a large supply of wing nuts and regular nuts. I've tried double nutting them and they'll sit up on the feeder and spin mm -hmm. until it unwinds. And of course, then you lose your nut and the top falls off and the food goes everywhere. <laughs> It's fun. They're clever uh, little birds. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've been through a couple of incarnations of brooders. Um, first, we uh, had we had the brooder set up in our basement, and that was very bad. Don't ever do that. Um, it was okay for the first two weeks, and then in week three, it was terrible. Um, and so we moved them to our garage and that was fine um except we had i don't know how how much research everyone's done into brooders but we had a brooder that had a two foot wall and then a hover that hangs in the middle that the chicks can go under to get warm and it was five foot by 12 foot because we were doing 120 birds at a time mm -hmm. and that was fine except for that the feed didn't hang and the water didn't hang. So it was constantly full of chips. And then also as they got into like week three mm. or four, they could hop up on that wall. And so when we, it came time to catch them and take them outside into the field, it was- um, They were all over the place. <laughs> so that was very inefficient. <laughs> um, and so we, are now in our third incarnation of brooders, um, which I'm going to show you this little video here in a second. Um, but one of the things that we learned in our third incarnation of brooders, um, which we started with last season, so in season two, we built the brooders you're about to see, and they did not have lids. They have a four foot tall wall that's made of hardware cloth, um, and that was just fine in season two. But this season, um, the rats discovered our chicks and we lost 80 chicks to rats. Um, and that was really not a good way to start the season. 
Um, so the moral of that story is you want rooters that will keep your birds in and will keep predators out. And you may not think you have predators because we didn't think nope. we did, but you will. Yes. They will find you. It may take a season or two, but they will find you. If, if you have animals and feed, you will have spilling and you will have rats. You will have rats, which means you will then have snakes. Um, snakes will come to eat the rats, but they'll also eat the chicks. Yes. <laughs> So. The cats we have now will eat the rats, but they also want to eat the chicks, so <laughs> lids. Lids, yes. Okay, so we have a little video for you. This is our brooder space. We have it set up with five brooders. Um, so we put a batch of chicks in once a week. This first brooder is only for one-week chicks. So they spend their time in this little one, and then they go each of the brooders has a lid that divided into two pieces. So can can you turn up the volume? Pick that up. It's, it. it's as high as I can make it. I'm sorry. Would you all be able to narrate right over? Um, These are one week old chicks. saying over the, um, the peeps of the birds. So if you can explain what's happening in the video, I think that, that would um, probably be most helpful. Yes. Okay. Right. So um, what I'm saying in the video is that th these are our one week old chicks. They've moved out of that first little brooder and they're in, in the big brooder now. Um, they have their hanging heat lamp. They ha their feed is in that hanging feeder, but the feeder is sitting on the ground um, until they get just a little bit bigger, and then we're going to hang it up on that on this S hook, um, and we can um, raise it as they get bigger. There's a, a piece of plywood on top of the lid that that is tied to. We also have the the hanging heat lamp is tied in with bailing twine to that two by four. You want to absolutely make sure that there is no way that your heat lamp can get knocked down into the chips and start a fire. Um, additionally, um, we use, uh, when we set up our brooders, we use um, composted wood chips as a base layer. So we get free chips delivered from a tree company and we let them sit and um, and compost for about six months and what happens there's there's they don't break down really but you get lots of biological activity and fungal activity happening in those chips and when you put that in your brooder it allows you know then you top dress with with the wood shavings that you get at the feed store it allows for um, better biological activity so that it's not as smelly. You don't have as many health problems with birds being in, um, in their poop that's not getting broken down. Yeah. Um, so we started doing that in our second season and found that our mortality went down um, and it was very helpful and also less smelly. Um, and we also use, I don't know, um, it already showed in the video, but in the bottom right corner is those chick stands. We put the water on that. Right there. So that helps keep the shavings out of their water. For the first two weeks, they don't scratch a whole lot. We have 
Uh, obviously, they are scratching, but they don't fill things up nearly as much as they do in weeks two, three, and four. So um, I think we can move on from that. So the um, so we get chicks delivered once a week. They come in the mail. The post office will call you and say, "Your chicks are here. Please come get them." They really don't want to keep custody of them any longer than they have to. Um, so we, you want to get them installed right away because they will have been in the mail with no food or water for between one and two days. Typically they ship on Tuesdays and lots of Wednesdays we have them. Lately it's been Thursday. Yeah. And so it's important to get them out and they're amazingly self-sufficient. Once you put them down, we've got some more little video. Here. So you wanna make sure you dip each chick feet into the water um, so that they get a drink and they know where it is. Um, and then after that, they, it's amazing. They are just on the go. They find the food and they're in business. All right, so um, feeding them. Uh, that is really, um, it's subjective. So um, definitely affects how much they eat, how much they gain from how much they ate. Um, from batch to batch, it varies. Some of them are gonna, eat like crazy and some not so much. Um, the way that we have been doing it is we start them off for 40 chicks. We start them off with a pound of food. I add about 0.4, well, the first week I add 0.2 pounds per day. And then after that, I add 0.4 pounds per day as long as they are finishing their food. The little ones, um, they're not going to eat some of the larger pieces in the food like the field peas they they tend to leave those i just dump them out into the on the ground in their brooder and they scratch through it um but as long as they're eating all the fines then i give them more food until they get to about um six weeks and then i i'm kind of capping it there because the first few batches that we did this year were like mega chickens. They were <laughs> like no smaller than five and a half pounds. And a lot of them were seven plus, right? Six to seven pounds. They were way too big. Um, we cut all those birds down for parts. Um, so it, it, like I said, it, there is no hard and fast rule. You're going to have to dial into it and kind of figure it out as you go along, which is exactly what we've done. And we're kind of figuring it out again this year because last year we did 30 birds a week and this year we're doing 40 birds a week. This year we started in March, last year we started in April. So the weather plays, yeah. plays a role, but um, you know, a little bit of a snapshot. This is what I was giving each batch um, on the seventh day. Uh, so, for the first one here, one week old, that was their seventh day of life. That's what they got. And then the two weeks old, they were fully two weeks old. That's what they got that day. Um, we use, uh, we get our feed from Aaron um, Cooper. Da Cooper down at Cut Fresh Organics in Eden near Salisbury. He does the Fertrell recipes. So we get the Fertrell chick starter, um, they get that for the first four weeks, um, except in the earlier weeks of spring, they get it for five weeks because we don't put them out on pasture until they're five weeks when the weather's cool. Um, and then once they're on pasture, they get the Fertrell broiler mix, which is a little bit lower in protein. Um, when they're in the brooder, you want to make sure they have access to grit. Uh, we were buying grit at the feed store and then we saw somewhere online that really all you need to do is go dig up some sand 
and that's all they need. So it's a good excuse to go down to the river. Yes. And enjoy the sunset <laughs> and get a bucket of sand. <laughs> so that's what we do now. Um, you, when they're small, like the first week or two, you want to keep an eye out for lethargic chicks. Sometimes when, when they're, when they're, sometimes they're just power napping. It's kind of amazing they, how flat they can get. They look really dead. But um, if they're lethargic, if they're truly lethargic, like when you, when you kind of touch them and they don't jump awake and run around, um, check and make sure that they don't have something called pasty butt, which is basically where the poop just is caking up on their little butt and they can no longer excrete it. And that, it backs up in their system and, and they die. And if they have that, then you just have to give them a little bath um, and, and so soak them in warm soak, water, soak and, them in warm and, water. And, and work it out. Yeah. Um, so um, other things, it, it's very important to keep your chickens um, pretty dry. So the first season that we, we had our broilers, um, there is a section of our field that's kind of a low spot. And our tractors hit that low spot right at a point in the season where we were getting a lot of rain. And they were spending a lot of time with their feet wet. And we got a lot of chickens with like um, raspy, cough raspy, you know, junky, rattly chests. Um, so we started treating them with apple cider vinegar in their water and um, drops of oregano essential oil in their water. Oregano is um, a great antibiotic. Uh, and that seemed to do the trick. We don't do that prophylactically because it's it would be expensive um, and there's not a whole lot of margin in chickens. Um, so, and then we feel like the composted wood chips is a great prophylactic. Great, great start. Yeah. yeah. Gets, gets them off and out into the field healthy and then not having 20 inches of rain before June makes a difference. Too. <laughs> um, breed, Brian, you want to talk about? Um, yeah, sure. We, we went with the Freedom Ranger um, because we were more interested in a, in a heritage type bird. And after reading like Joel Salatin's books and his, his blog posts of, well, we, we raised the Cornish cross because that's what the customer expects. Um, I didn't really buy that because there's so much, so many health issues associated with the Cornish cross and 10% mortality is kind of built in. Um, and we figured that was just unacceptable. Um, so we we did a little little searching around and, and settled on the freedom ranger they do take a little longer they're an 11 week bird um which we we shoot for maturity at 11 weeks as opposed to 48 days um i don't think it's good for a bird to grow that fast um the the um the freedom rangers have a higher omega-3 um content and they have beautiful yellow fat they're a, they're a really nice dressed bird they're not obscenely chesty but they're they're a nice size and i'm always happy to to cut one up and i'm pretty picky about my chickens um they're they're tough our mortality it's mm -hmm. it's it's unusual to lose more than one or two out of an entire batch um and oftentimes that's because they're underfoot we've yeah. crushed them by mistake or closed their head in the door or they occasionally run over one with the tractor um, because yeah. they're not smart enough to get out of the way so those are we'll, we'll touch on moving tractors in a bit um, yeah and I, I'm the person who's selling the birds at the market and I've never had somebody come up to me and say this chicken isn't like what I expected it to be if they don't have a big enough breast or no mostly people come up and say oh my gosh your chicken was amazing so um I, I wouldn't be too worried about having to grow a cornish cross because it's what's expected so typical progression uh just really quick these are one week old birds um we keep them on heat for between three and four weeks depending on the season so here they are at two weeks they're starting to get a little more feathers on their wings here they are at three weeks, getting a little more feathered out. Here they are at four weeks out on pasture. They're almost fully feathered except for their heads and kind of under their wings. This is six weeks, eight weeks, 
And then these guys are almost 11 weeks or like 10 and a half. Um, okay, so tractors. We use the, the, we bought the plans from John Suskovich. Um, his website address is at the end of the presentation. Jennifer, we bought his tractor plans. Um, yes. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you, how much problems do you have with uh, predatory birds? Because in my area, I, I got to worry about hawks and eagles big time. You do it on your area too. Um, so, uh, um, in our layers, uh, aerial predators are a problem. Um, with the houses, with the chicken huts, we've never, we don't have any issues except in our. Was it the second year or the first year? The first. So the first end year. Of the first year. The end of the first year, we um, decided, hey, let's try to truly free range these birds, and we put up um, uh, electric poultry net and put it around the houses and let the birds free range with the houses as shelter, and. Because these are all juvenile birds. They're not very smart. We got a red tail hawk that treated our broilers like the 7-Eleven. And he came every day and helped himself to a bird for 25 days. And they would watch him come in. Oh, here he comes. And they were not smart enough to take cover. I mean, he like we literally drove home one day and he was sitting on top of one of the tractors just, and the birds were all be bopping around like there was no issue. So we do not free range <laughs> our broilers anymore. They just, they're not mature enough. They don't have any defense. They don't know to, they don't know to take cover from predators. It's just, um, it, and, and truly, even when they had access to, to run around and forage, they're not, highly mobile birds like our layers are. They are very happy to just lay down on the ground after they've had a nice scoop of grain. Um, so, so we just, we went back to everyone's in a tractor, the tractor moves every day. Um, so with these, with these tractors, um, they have the hanging feeders that you see on your left. Um, those are made from PVC pipe that, that comes with the plans how to do that. Um, one, we modified these tractors in two ways. The first way um, is we put these um, side mount nipple drinkers. I know we said we don't like the nipple drinkers at the beginning. We don't like the ones that the birds go underneath of the hanging nipple um, drinkers. The side mount ones don't leak nearly as much. They um, cost twice as much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, they, but they work. Um, so Brian created this gravity fed system um, with, with the side mount nipple drinkers. So that's one um, way that we, we adapted the tractor. And then um, also we set them up in the first season with a hot wire that went around the outside of each tractor and then we had jumpers from tractor to tractor just daisy chained them with one mm -hmm. one energizer yeah and that was to prevent because we have a lot of foxes around and we were worried that the foxes would dig under the tractor and get in and and eat the chickens um so we had it set up that way and then when we free range them they all like to sit on top of those hot wires and break them um, so when season two got started, they were all broken and we were like, oh, I guess we need to fix those. And we never really got around to it. And, and we didn't have a problem. And we never had a problem. <laughs> so we're running them right now without a hot wire. And probably tomorrow we'll go out and find out we had a problem because we told you all it's fine. <laughs> but um, we're, we're doing it that way for now. Um, but that is an option. So we, we kind of added that little... Um, piece of two by four on the corner at, with an insulator on it and then ran the wires around. Um, this is what the, we also added this kind of bench on the back of the tractor to hold the water bucket for the gravity fed water. Um, so those two, other than that, these tractors are all bit, built exactly the way the plans specify. And we have a little video here for you. I hope you can hear this one better.
So this is a every morning. <laughs> You do need to watch and make sure the birds aren't loitering in the back or running out underneath on the sides. And then I always just push down on it and make sure it's sitting firmly on the ground and not up on the grass. And we take the wheels off and we go to the next, next tractor. I use one set of wheels for 10 tractors. probably not loud enough so they'll typically go through about a half of a five gallon bucket for, for on average the smaller birds don't don't go through quite as much um, we just top it off it goes down through a half inch hose with female fittings on it onto the PVC with the nipple drinkers uh, it's a little bit of work to try to get a hole in a five gallon bucket and fittings that don't leak that's looking back up. Typically after seven days, it's green back up. That's typical slick. And they started up at that barn. So pasture height ideally is about 12 inches. This is taller than ideal, but the clover was wonderful. So we let it go. Um, if if it gets too tall, if the grass gets tall, when you move the tractor, it just lodges down and you get a slick and they don't get much forage. Um, the clover tends to pop back up and they love it. And so within a 24 hour period, they will pretty well pick every leaf off the clover there is. And they love the flowers. Uh, we had a bunch of barley coming up this year in the pasture. And that was a very wonderful treat for them. For the littler birds, we'll walk it down a little bit so they don't get lost and stuck um, underneath. Clover's got a lot of protein in it, and so they, um, they do a lot of feed with that. Those are our feed barrels we buy in bulk. Um, we start out with about 1,000 pounds every two weeks, and now we're moving up to a ton of every two weeks. Um, those are pickle barrels that hold anywhere between 250 and 300 pounds and we just stage them off the trailer about every four days worth of space. So, um, let's talk about processing a little bit. Um, so we just want to kind of cover what kind of infrastructure you're going to need to process birds. Um, we previously were using our stock trailer. We would load the chickens up onto our stock trailer and just pull from that when we processed. But that's not always convenient. Sometimes, Especially if the goats are on the road. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> we actually need to use it for livestock. So um, this year we built kind of a mini chicken tractor and we can pick that up and set it on our landscape trailer and what we do is we load the birds up into that we put hay in the bottom of it um, the night before we're going to process um, and that there's two benefits to that one processing day is a really long day and so not having to go out and catch 40 birds and load them up saves time and two, it lowers the stress of the day for the birds. Yeah. So they've already gone through kind of that little panic of somebody trying to snatch them and getting moved and being in a new environment. And they settled in and spent the night there and they're pretty chill when it comes time for processing. And I think that is My better for the end product and better for the birds. Make, making the, the stress load on the bird as minimal as possible is really critical, I think. Trying to, to, to make that one bad moment of their life as short as possible yes. is, is good for the bird, it's good for the product, it's the right thing to do. Um, so then um, you're gonna need to have a killing cone. So we, we use the 
method of inverting the bird and cutting the carotid arteries. Um, and so you're gonna need something like this set up for that, you know, they need a place to bleed into. My um, first one was a was an orange traffic cone through the hole in a sink that didn't have a drain into a bucket, which isn't very efficient, but it worked. <laughs> And I was only doing three or four birds at a time. So that was easy. When you're doing this many birds, you want to be as efficient as possible. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to want a scalder. I think Brian's original scalder was a 55 gallon drum sitting on top of a propane, a propane yeah. <laughs> heated burner. Um, so you can be as low tech or high tech as you need or want to be. Um, we were lucky enough to, to get a second hand um, Featherman set up we took the rotisserie off of our scalder because we just didn't like the way it was working and we just dip them by hand in that. Um, you'll want a plucker. Some people don't use a plucker and just do everything by hand. We can't even imagine doing 40 birds in a day without going through this step. It really makes a big difference. Um, and also you're gonna want, if you look on the bottom left, that picture is all the feathers that come out of the bottom of the plucker. So you're gonna have to have a setup for capturing those feathers. And then you're gonna have to think about what you wanna do with those feathers when you're done. We have a compost pile for them. I will say that I don't love the location of it because invariably some animal, somebody likes to dig in it yes and it smells um so having it in a location where you don't have to enjoy it on a daily basis is a good thing and close enough that you don't have to haul the feathers aren't too bad if i let them let them sit for a couple of hours and dry out a little bit they don't weigh a lot but um the blood is heavy and the entrails are heavy and so if you don't have to haul them a long distance again we use our wood chips um which is a lot of carbon and they're already aged. So they've got a lot of bioactivity going. And for the most part, I think the vultures, we have, we have vul nesting vultures here in one of our barns and um, they, they pay very close attention to processing day <laughs> and uh, make, they, they recycle it into the young very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so then after they go through the mechanical plucker, then um, you're gonna wanna do clean up the pin feathers and make sure you get all of the, the little bits that the plucker doesn't get. Um, and then, uh, so you're gonna need a table space to do that. And then also eviscerate the birds and take all of the internal organs out. Um, you're gonna need a washing and um, soaking station. So they mm -hmm. get rinsed off. We, we lucked into a nice, um, Big double sink. Yeah, big um, and that we have plumbed with a hose. And um, so they get rinsed off there and then they get their first soak in mm -hmm. that sink. On the other half, they soak there for 20, 30 minutes. And then they go from there into an ice bath for multiple hours mm -hmm. while we finish everything else up. And from there they come out and I had built a a PVC stand, it's an octagon with an upright, a 12 inch upright on every corner, or not every corner, but every, every flat face. And so we can actually stand eight birds, invert them through the, through the vent cavity with their, their neck sticking up and then go over them. Once, they're, once they've been soaked and chilled, it's amazing what you can see because they get very pale. And um, so any pins are, that are left or, or weird little bits of schmutz we go through and make sure they all look good. Um, and once they run the water out, then we put them in a, in a shrink bag and dip them. And yeah, so you'll need a way to heat up water to 190 degrees so that you can shrink your poultry bags um, and then weigh them and label them. Um, so, before you can, pro I mean, well, you can certainly process them, but before you can sell them, you'll need to get your on-farm poultry and rabbit slaughter certificate from the Maryland Department of Agriculture. There's a class you have to take. You have to get your water tested. They say there's a site visit. We've never seen anyone. Um, 
and that will that will certify you to be able to sell from your farm if you want to take birds to the farmers market you will need need a food processing plant license from the Maryland Department of Health, um, which basically, I, I don't know, it's it's like a form you fill out and you tell them what, what your you're process gonna, You write a little essay of how we're yes. going to do this and this let is, them stay frozen. Yeah, how you're going to keep the birds frozen. Um, they will want to see your label um, and approve, both, both of them will want to see your and approve your label. Um, Packaging, we do shrink bags for the whole birds, um, which we get from Texas Poultry Shrink yeah. Bags, which there's a link to at the end. Um, we also cut birds down um, for parts, and so we bought a vacuum sealer for that. Um, your labels, and um, so in terms of your finished product, I guess, you know, you have to kind of feel into what your market wants. Um, the first season that we were processing, we already had a client before we got our first bird, and it was a, a small um, deli that wanted pasture-raised chickens. And so we were selling most of our birds to him. Um, and that relationship didn't work out and so our second season we were figuring out a new market and that was when we started with the farmers market we also found a few grocery stores um, and so we had to kind of figure out what people want and in the summertime we were selling some whole birds but when we ran out of freezer space oh my god we had to start parting out birds to make space and those things were very popular with our clients in the summertime. Um, so, you know, it's, it's gonna be different for everyone in terms of what's gonna work. Um, common mistakes to avoid. So I think don't bite off more than you can chew uh, was the first and biggest uh, lesson that we learned. So our first season, we did four batches of birds, one batch a month, 120 birds per batch so um and that was all well and good until it came time to process 120 birds with two people and originally we had this romantic notion in our mind that you know it was going to be a sense of community that would come together and we'd have this processing party and have a, a big, meal yeah we'd have a big <laughs> meal at the end to celebrate and guess how many people want to come kill chickens and cut them apart with you not no very one. many <laughs> so that model did not work at all and so we retooled for the second season and decided we would do a weekly batch and we felt like 30 birds a week was what brian and i could handle just the two of us and we just barely could it was a very long day we've gotten better at it though. we have gotten better <laughs> at it um and but it wasn't enough birds for for the market that we were serving Thing. And so this year we decided to go with 40 birds and we roped my daughter into a commitment of helping us process once a week. So, um, but we needed, we, before we bought the first bird, we made sure that we had the labor that we were going to need to process all those birds. Yeah, processing is, I don't know if any of you have ever done it. It's it's a long day because it's just it's time consuming you know you've got to get that bird off the trailer into the cone bleed it out scald it pluck it clean it up and and how well you do the first two the scald and the pluck it's determines cute. how much quality control you end up doing on the table um and some breed we ran one breed and called a uh, black broiler black broilers beautiful bird wonderful meat, a booger to clean. They had black pin feathers that were really hard to get off and they just left kind of a, a hairy armpit looking chicken that even though it was wonderful, I think you could have torched it off probably. Yeah, Some people do just, use a, get the, get the fuzz off with a, it wasn't with worth a torch, but it, they just too much work and that just slows you down. And when, when the scald is right and the pluck is good, we can roll through birds like crazy. 
probably like 10 an hour, yeah. I think was our, was the best we've done so far. Um, so, you know, and under that heading of not biting off more than you can chew, make sure you have your infrastructure ready. Um, we, on a number of occasions have said, okay, well, we're gonna do thus and such, and we have to have extra tractors built by this date. And then, you know, you're farming, so <laughs> nothing goes the way you're planning for it to go, and that date rolls in and you're in an emergency situation. So being aware of what you need and when you need it, and try not to back yourself into that corner. Um, is your pasture ready? So um, that, you know, that's a process and it's, it's going to be different for every situation, but yeah. it's a question to ask yourself. Um, what, you know, what is your pasture like? What is it, what needs to happen to it to be ideal? What's the process to get it there? How will having birds on it in the meantime affect that process? Mm -hmm. um, some people run them on their lawn I don't and like you can that. but it well it puts a lot of flies up close to your house um but a diverse true pasture with you know multiple species five six eight species in it is a whole nother animal and and that's really what we're looking at is how do we grow the best soil we can well roots and manure um and so we like having a we finally in year two at our long field first we first year we had that split it was an organic half of it was an organic soybeans and half of it was ours and then the second year we got the whole field and we had an incredible weed load it was incredibly compacted and i finally at the end of the season had the whole thing disked by a neighbor and we seeded the darn thing down and this year it's wonderful we don't we don't have the detura we don't have the, as much johnson grass we're still fighting thistles which we will for a while but not as much but it's much better than it was and um i think next year is going to be even better and we'll interplant even more species into it so we have a nice progression from cool season to warm season because our seasons change drastically here we go from cool wet to hot dry mm -hmm. humid but you know we haven't had a whole lot of rain well three inches at a time but it's spread out <clears throat> So, so, the, so those are the environmental reasons not to put your birds on lawn. But I think from a bird health perspective, um, part of the reason to pasture raise a chicken, um, I mean, it's more humane, of course, than having them crowded into barns, but also they do benefit from that forage value. They do benefit from, they love to eat the grasshoppers. They love to eat the clover. <laughs> if you've got them on three inch lawn, there is nothing to yeah, eat. It's like being on estrogen. And they're poop machines. So if they're in this short, short grass, they're basically just in their own poop like they would be in a barn. Um, so, there's those considerations. Um, we talked about being ready for predators, even if you don't think you have them, just anticipate them, build, you know, predator proofing into your systems before they're an issue. Um, make sure you have freezer space while you are establishing a market. So, you know, we did run into that in year two where we were still getting our name out there. We were still building a market and we were making birds faster than we were selling them and so round birds are hard to store yes they, they take up a lot of space they take up a lot of space you can't put them in an upright freezer <laughs> they roll out <laughs> uh, and then plan for growth so you know we set you know we've grown our business two years in a row and you know think about what needs to happen in order to grow it progressively as you're setting things up mm -hmm. you know if i build things this way and then i and then i'm ready to expand because there's demand you know how how does that factor in um so those are just things to think about um everybody oh, should have one, received oh go ahead one more thing on that um along with with that planning for growth your processing equipment is going to be like, you know, the, the labor involved is, is definitely a bottleneck, but your equipment is gonna be a bottleneck as well. So for us to grow much more, 
um, we would need to upgrade our equipment. And we were very fortunate that we got a super deal on this package, which knew would cost about five grand. Um, and I was looking this morning at, at the next step up for scalders and just the scalder is five grand. Um, and then the plucker, a bigger plucker is going to be $3,000. So there's, it, there's a, there are reasons why people stuff birds in a box and take them to someplace else. We don't want to have that stress. And quite honestly, I don't want to trust something that we've worked so hard at to grow to, I, I, I don't like anything being processed off farm. Some things you were forced into. Pigs can't be, well, if we're going to sell it, you can't do a pig here on the farm. That's all got to be USDA. Um, well, frankly, you can't find a place to process a non Cornish. Yes, that's also true. The, the, the contract um, poultry processors want a Cornish cross because they go through the system faster. They, they just, they're more, they're, used, they're geared for they're that. Geared for that. Um, and I didn't eat meat for 30 years because I didn't feel like I could kill it. Um, and We've integrated that into our system because it's really important for sustainable agriculture. And so I wanna make sure that that last moment is as, as, as calm and as peaceful as it can be when you're, when you're killing something. But I feel much better about pulling a knife myself than sending it off to somebody else. You, might, you, you, you all may not feel that way, I don't know. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Okay, so um, everyone should have received an Excel sheet and my intention was to have that updated with all of the numbers that we have um, to date because I work on a Mac and I, um, and I use a Mac numbers and um, when I export my spreadsheet that we use every day to Excel, Excel does some weird formatting. And so I have to use somebody else's computer to fix it so that you could have it. So I did that a couple of months ago in anticipation of this workshop, but then I really wanted to give everyone the most current numbers and we just couldn't, I couldn't make that happen this week. So I apologize for that, but I will update all of the data um, in an Excel version and give it to me that she can send to everyone. Um, but that particular Excel sheet, I think the original version of it did come from John Suskovich's website. And then we've made changes every year to answer the questions that we had about our own business and, you know, find the data that we needed and refine it to our own operation. Um, so the, the version you have is, you know, where we are right now with what we want it to do. Um, but it, it has four sheets. Um, one is an overall of the whole business um, with profit and loss. And then there, there's what we fed them each batch every day. Um, what our costs are, what our yields are, and what our sales are. And um, those are broken down by market as well as by um, time of year. So um, hopefully everybody will find that informative or at least a jumping off point to create something that works for your own business. Um, it's, it's, I think, helpful to have something that you can fix rather than start from scratch. Um, so that's that. And then um, these are a bunch of resources that I thought, you know, we thought would be helpful. Um, you know, we get our feed from Cutfresh that, you know, there's his website, the, the link for buying the tractor plans. And then on the um, John Suskovich's website, I, there's a bunch of videos. He has too, a bunch of videos. Um, which is really helpful. Um, it's, it's a good place to build from. Um, because it gives you some visuals of what, what does it actually take to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so. That's... Although his video that his mother-in-law can pull those tractors every day <laughs> is a little like, 
I don't know about that one. On the but, lawn, maybe. Yeah, on the lawn, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't even lift the tractor to get the wheel on. So, or I can lift it, or I can put the wheel on, but I can't do both. And I'm a fairly it. strong person. Hold it with one hand and stick the wheel on. Yeah. There, a, a simple little lever would be easy to fabricate. And I always told Jennifer I'd do that, but I haven't done that. It's on the list. It's on, yes. Um, so processing equipment, Featherman is very well regarded. That's what we have. Um, we get our chicks from Freedom Range or Hatchery, the shrink bags. Um, we also get our labels from the Texas poultry shrink bags people. And I think it's actually their son. He started it. He yep. does. And he's a kid. He does. He prints all these labels. And I, I'm pretty sure that's like his college fund or something yeah. that, um, so we, we like that. And then, um, at the bottom, there's, those are two books that, um, that Brian felt were really helpful before you can we got started. Read Salad and Pastured Poultry Profits. It's, it looks like it was written on a typewriter. Um, it's an old book of his back when he was, when nobody knew who he was. Um, and he, as, as, as all things Salad, and he's, he's very practical and, and simple. And I don't, personally, I don't like the, the poultry boxes just because I think they're too small and they're they're hard to move on well they're easy to move but I, I just don't like them for as they're not as aesthetically pleasing for sure yeah they're they're <laughs> they're kind of Soviet looking um <laughs> but it, it's practical and it does give you like a good overview of of chick to product and they do a fantastic job with processing and and so I don't want to take anything away from Joel's process. He's, he does a good job. Uh, the small scale poultry book was where I started with chickens. And that'll give you a, a great overview of not only meat birds, but laying birds and oddball birds like ducks and turkeys and, um, and such. And there's a lot of them out there and a lot of videos. Um, okay, so that's what we have and um, this is how you can get in touch with us. And, you know, uh, we would have loved to have had everybody out to the farm to do this all in person um, because, you know, I think we, we, we could have gotten into a whole bunch of more things, but, um, and hopefully next year we'll do that. Um, but you're all welcome to reach out and arrange a time to come and visit um, if you so desire. And um, I am going to turn off my screen share so that Neve can turn it over for questions. Um, perfect. Well, thank you both so much. That was fantastic. And uh, I think that this is a good time actually to take a quick break. Um, and so if people want, so we'll take a 10 minute break. And if people want to take time to also look at that budget sheet and see if they have particular questions, um, that's, that's an option. But when we come back from the break, then we can go into Q&A. We have about, uh, we could do about 15 minutes of Q&A for your section. And then after that, um, we'll talk about considerations. So Lindsay Gilmore will talk afterwards about considerations if you're growing um, vegetables and fruit along with livestock, things that you need to be taking into consideration to make sure that you've got the health and safety of um, uh, your consumers in mind, um, amongst other really great tips for sustainability and efficiency. So um, yeah, so there are a lot of really great questions that have been popping up in the chat box. And since there was a little bit of lag time on the computer, we thought it was better just to go ahead and do all the questions at the end. So why don't we come back in um, 10 minutes? Well, I guess it's an awkward time, but uh, 1217, we'll meet back and then we'll go through those questions that have come up <laughs> in the chat box. So um, yeah, great, we'll, we'll see you all shortly. And Thank you. Neve, am I okay to start asking questions now while you're doing yeah. that? Okay, okay, great, great. Um, so thank you so much, Brian and Jennifer. That was so fun to watch. I'm not, uh, <laughs> there's so many great things like, um, I don't know, pasty butt. There's so many uh, great takeaways. <laughs>
I'll be thinking about all week. Um, but there were, I think you answered in the course of your presentation already a number of the questions that came through. So I'm just trying to select out the ones that maybe um, would be good to expand on. So there are a couple questions here that relate to establishing or improving pasture. So like these are all pasture related questions. So um, one question is, um, well, I think it would be kind of, we have 15 minutes. Um, yep. Okay, so I think it would be interesting to get first, just your take on like, um, if you were approaching a new piece of land, right? Like that, uh, or when you got to your farm, um, how did you think about like he prioritize, here's how we want to improve the pasture and here's our approach? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that would require organization. Um, <clears throat> We, I, I wish we'd been that proactive. We, um, we've been more reactive as far as, oh my God, this is what's happening now. Um, so, you know, our first year was, was the monsoon year. And so we saw, obviously we have an infiltration problem. We had a lot of Johnson grass and foxtail. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Johnson grass we're continuing to fight. And, but it's not But bad. it's not as bad, it's, so. It's very spotty now. Keeping it cut, and um, we've run the goats across that, and last year we had a boatload of detura pop up, but thankfully so far we've not seen it. I hope it's late enough that we're not gonna deal with that. Um, and I was not good about getting it cut all before it went to seed, so there's a seed source out there, but we've got enough other the clover was really dense this year. The, the other grasses, there's three or four other pasture grasses that I'm not real good at in there as well. So it's dense enough. We seem to have a good mat that's keeping it at bay. Yeah, I think so like the key, what, what we did when we took it over from it being in grain crops. So like the first year that we had the pasture, we just had half of it. Basically what we got was what came up when they didn't grow grain crops anymore. And so oh. some of that I think was like old cover crop seed. Some of it was weed seed. I mean, you kind of just see what you get. And what we had was what we had. The second year, um, we paid the neighbor farmer to come and disc the field. And then Brian drat, like put a big thing on the back back of the truck and and dragged the field to make it even and then he god bless him he <laughs> he seeded that entire seven acre field with a hand crank with one of that he put on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. one step at a time nice. um so 700 and, pounds of feet <laughs> yeah so and 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 we got a decent amount of pasture out of that in year two but we had a lot of foxtail and we had a lot of johnson grass but he seeded that in the spring so you know there wasn't like a whole lot of time for it to get established before we were running birds on it this year um we had excellent um clover cover in the winter i think somebody asked about that the, the, in that mix, there were several, three kinds of clover. Mm -hmm. And um, that came up in the winter four. time. Four, four yeah, kinds sweet, of clover. Sweet clover and crimson and, um, and mammoth red and some white. Um, and that clover did an amazing job of crowding out the Johnson grass. And we have not, knock on wood, seen any foxtail yet. So, um, it was so dense, maybe a little more dense than we really want it to be. You couldn't purpose, walk through it. <laughs> yeah, for the purpose of running birds across it, but it's been great in terms of getting the bad stuff out. And so I think now our next step is going to be overseeding it again this fall with some additional grasses that we'd like to see in there with the clover. Um, and I think, you know, really ultimately the answer is just keep putting down seed for what you want to see and i've been it, it i've been balance. following the tractors with buckwheat because aaron Ooh. had a big bunch of musty buckwheat that he said if you could make that tote go away so i brought home a thousand pounds of buckwheat which now i have to figure out a way to get rid of um so any of the 
tractor tracks I walk along and I hand seed in um, and behind the chicken, the, the laying hens as well. We, so, you know, it's an annual, so just getting that mixed in. Uh, if we were doing a lot more grazing, uh, like for the goats, I'd want to put in more brassica and some other things like that, but you, they, they're woody enough, you can't pull the tractors across them. Mm -hmm. So for the, for the broilers, that's just not a really good, good species mix. And so there are two questions here that are asking for, if, if you don't mind going into kind of more specificity on what do you, and it sounds like you change it up a bit, but what do you, what are you putting in your seed mixes and where do you source them? Um, are, you, are you using like a pre-made blend? Are you coming up with your own thing based on what you see? And, and where do you source your seed? Uh, so far, we have been, been using a mix. And I got a kind of generic um, mixed animal pasture grass, non-specific to horses. And I got it from King Farm over in Delaware, which is outside of Dover, um, which is really handy for us being on the shore. So yeah, so it was a pre-made mix. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, and then um, and we have been seeing some things in like vetch and and um, some field pea. We're seeing things that are coming out of the feed actually, which is kind of interesting. We had a whole bunch of barley. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, okay, cool. So <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Um, just going right through the animals. Um, so, uh, uh, so then the other question about pasture here is. Um, is this, are, are there other considerations, like if you have shared pasture with your layers and your goats, it sounds like you're not using it for the goats so much that this pasture is really just for the, but I guess there's no, a question the goats, about mixed use for the pasture. If, if the goats go on it, uh, they go on it for one of two reasons. They go on it ahead of the chickens to try and bring the height down. And then additionally, in the winter time, we did have them out there grazing some of that clover just because we, need, we needed some green. That's all there is. <laughs> um, but no, the, the pasture that we have our broilers on right now is basically just for broilers. We have a separate section that we rotate our layers around. Um, we like to try and let it recover as much as we can as we move the tractors across it because, I mean, you are putting down a whole lot of nitrogen. And phosphorus. And phosphorus. <laughs> um, so, you know, we don't, we don't want to overload it. Originally, with our layers, we were, we were rotating them on about an acre and a half. And then this year, we haven't had them on there at all. We've had the goats on it at least twice. Um, but we ran them in a strip just above where the broilers were. So we had a section for the broilers, we had a section for the layers, and then there's a section on the lower section that's got a bunch of frag in it that the pigs are going to get to sooner or later. One day. Sooner, yeah. <laughs> um, One day when we move them. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so then the remaining so, questions I think can kind of be categorized together as predator pressure questions. Um, mm. So uh, one question was, um, if you face any fox and coyote pressure, I know you guys talked about running that hot wire around and sort of experimenting with, you know, having it hot or not. Um, but like general, I guess, yeah, your thoughts on, I guess foxes and coyotes, but any other like broad picture predator yeah. uh, questions? Um, we have been, knock on wood, really lucky that the foxes have not seemed to be interested in our broilers. I'm sure that me saying that out loud was a really bad idea, but that's the way it's been so far. We did have, um, we have a lot of fox around and this is our third season on this property. And up until this year, we've not had an issue with foxes. Inside electric net. Yeah, that, because our, here. our layers are, um, are in an electric poultry net. Um, this is the first year this spring we had one fox that figured out that it could jump the poultry net and it jumped the poultry net a whole lot. Uh, we lost a lot of layers to that fox. 
Um, he's no longer with us. And we have not had, knock on wood, any issues since then. So, I mean, for the most part, anything that leads with its nose, the electric works really well. You know, they, 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 they're curious about it. They find out that it bites and then they pretty much leave it alone. Great. Uh, uh, we, we have coyotes around, similar situation. I think we're really fortunate that on this particular property, there's so much diversity. They're, they're not farming it hedgerow to hedgerow. So there's mm -hmm. 30 plus acres of constructed wetlands in CREP. There's lots of um, forest. forest areas. Um, there's there's um, brush and trees around the outsides of the fields. And so there is a, an habitat. abundance of and variety of wildlife. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we've got rabbits like crazy and I kind of read the rabbits. If I've got plenty of rabbits hopping around and the fox pressure isn't all that high, when the rabbits disappear, then you have to start paying attention. Um, the bird life has gone up way high. So yeah. um, we we're really excited about um, this year. We've seen an incredible jump in bird diversity. diversity. Um, so, and and I we kind of hold that thought that okay we've got our pastures are getting more diverse and healthier and that has to be contributing. I love it. So there's a there's a quick clarification question here from Vince asking if the netting is 48 inch. Yes, yes. it is 48 inch uh, poultry net from oh, Premier. Yeah, great. Um, and then and running solar. And then there solar was a question a, about the brooder, oh, on a solar charger from yep. Premier as well. Every, every, everybody's got, I don't know, we've got about nine solar chargers banging around this farm. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. And then there was a question, I think, about the brooders um, asking kind of about the, I think that part of the video went fast um, about like the construction of your current brooder um, setup. Mm -hmm. But I think actually that that might, those videos are embedded in the slides that will get sent out. Is that yes. right, Neve? Yes. So it might, yes. so, so you will get a copy of that as well as a copy of the recording of this. So I think, um, let me just make sure that their the question setup is, is four by five foot and it's got four foot hard, half inch hardware cloth. And then the, the lids were put into two pieces. So each brooder has a two part lid again with half inch hardware cloth. Um, and are each of and, the, go ahead. Or are each of the brooders the same size, or does it get bigger as the birds get bigger? Was the other part of the question. They're the same size, with the exception of that first kind of um, little brooder that's half the height of the, the other brooders. That brooder was actually we built this year because we were starting our birds a lot earlier in the spring and we knew they were gonna need an extra week in the brooder. So we wanted a fifth brooder, um, but we didn't really have space to build another full size brooder. Um, so we built that little one. And that's five by two by two. Yeah, so we, we created an extra step for ourselves because we have to take those chicks out of there and put them in one of the other brooders. So basically like the way it works is on Tuesday, the oldest birds, the four week birds come out, they go in crates, they go out and get put in a tractor. And then the birds that are in the little brooder come out of the little brooder and go into the one that was just vacated. And then the chicks come in the mail and they go into the little brooder. So we created an extra step for ourselves by doing it that way, but we just did, we didn't have the space to build an, a fifth full-size brooder. And it gave us a table. It did, it gave us a table. <laughs> <laughs> so I measure feet on top of them. <laughs> nice. um, I think there's just one last question here, which is um, what breed or breeds you tend to use for layers? Oh, um, our main flock are all red sex links. And then we have a second flock that are, I call my fancy birds because I got addicted to collecting different heritage breed chickens because- Occupational hazard. Occupational. Fun and pretty. 
um, and I like their colored eggs. So, um, but I would never rely on them to make money laying eggs because they're hit and miss. They, you know, they lay when it's not too hot and it's not too cold and they're not in a bad mood and <laughs> and you feed them the same every day whether they're giving you an egg or not so if, i don't think they don't even break even i'm no, sure no they they're, do not break even they, they break a lot fun. of eggs too they're, yes they break a lot of eggs <laughs> oh so so, uh, so conclusion they're pretty and unreliable and then so matt asks they're, they're, they're trophy chickens <laughs> 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 um, uh, Matt asks where you get the red sex links from. In East Side Street. No, we got. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you can get pullets from um, Moyers, but only in the spring and the, the fall. fall. After after everything's been locked down and you've been decimated by a fox and yeah, and everybody wants eggs. <laughs> there, yeah, this year was a tough year to get pullets. But then we also, um, and Matt, we can hook you up. Um, we go down to Willisford in, in October and buy the birds that they are cycling out because Willisford down in Virginia, I think they thank run you, like Deb. seven. Yes, thank you, Deb. <laughs> they run like 700 Later. hens in the summer months. But they do not keep their um, their layers over the winter, so they're looking to get rid of them in October. And so we buy them. And what's nice about that is they're ready made. They're laying. You don't have. We to don't get lay. an interruption that way. So yeah. we can we can rotate birds in without an interruption in flock. And then so mm -hmm. we have one year birds and we have two year birds. And so we always have. Uh, a progression of layers mm -hmm. so we don't get as much time out of them but we don't end up feeding them for eight, four months, four months while, they, while yeah. they come on nice um i think i think those were all the i think you guys answered everything beautifully I, um I is, think is it, timing there was one more question um so the, there was a question do you find uh have you found any of the commercial or retail flag control options to be effective or worth using um, and so somebody did mention in the chat box that the star bar fly traps were pretty good. What, what has been your experience? Any of, any of them? Um, in? Our experience is that we need fly control. <laughs> so flies we, are terrible. Yeah, we used fly tape last year and it's just not effective. So we're, ex you know, we are actually, we're starting to re research options this year as it's gotten warm and the flies have gotten worse. Um, Parasitic wasps, I've read a lot about. Yeah, Various but, traps, mean, that doesn't really work in the barn as well. Um, so we're and, open to trying yeah. those, yeah. If, if yeah. Chickens create a lot of dust when they're in the barn, mm -hmm. which is why they're terrible in your house. And uh, why fly traps And fly there. traps fly get covered with, strips. with, uh, yeah, they get covered with dust, dust and then they don't stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the barn swallows, I think help, but not. We, we need not a lot enough. more barn swallows. Yeah, we need like a thousand barn swallows. It was a woman named Colleen who had mentioned about the star bar fly traps, and she said that uh, in her experience, you need multiple of them really for them to be effective. I don't, Colleen, are you still here? If so, did you want to unmute oh. and mention? Yeah, she's Colleen, actually. It looks like Colleen, but her name is Colleen. I know Colleen. Oh, nice. Hi, Colleen. <laughs> She may not, she may be gone. Yeah. Okay, well, um, well, we'll take this as our chance to transition. So thank you guys so much for that. And, um, you know, the, the slides that we'll be sharing from um, Jennifer and Brian have their contact information. So if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to us and we can help as well. Um, but so great, we'll shift uh, gears at this time over to Lindsay Gilmore, who is a food safety specialist and um, take it away, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. And uh, Brian and Jennifer, that was really fun for the non-chicken growers amongst us too. All right. Oh, where am I? So I get to talk about the really fun stuff, <laughs> which is food safety. Um, 
something that Chesapeake Harvest and Future Harvest have been working on over the last year. We've got another few months to go on this particular project where we're helping people think about the different food safety risks on their farms and how to reduce risk. Um, so let me just set this up. Uh, I will say that uh, some of the stuff in, in this presentation applies more to farmers that are selling wholesale and therefore might be subject to the, the FSMA produce safety rule or to GAP certification if they're GAP certified. Some of it is just common sense. So I'll try to point out what's what as I go along, but please ask questions if you can, if you're concerned about whether or not you have to comply with any regulation or with any GAP certification. So raising livestock alongside produce. Human beings have been doing it for millennia. And so today we're gonna to talk about what the food safety hazards may be. Uh, lots of little greebly things. I love these images, particularly the parasite one. That's really kind of creepy looking, but anyway. Uh, so just some examples of human pathogens that also may be pathogens, they, they may also make the animals themselves sick. Uh, so Campylobacter, E. coli is the one, uh, E. coli, Listeria and Salmonella are the ones people tend to be most familiar with or they've heard the most about, but there are lots of others and this is just an example, a set of examples. And typically um, younger animals are shedding uh, pathogens at a higher rate than older animals or any animals under stress. So maybe at the, the height of the summer when it's very hot uh, or any animals with any kind of health issues may be shedding more than others. So you just want to think about that. Um, maybe you take a little bit more care with the young animals than you do with the older animals and so on. So poop is really the main thing you need to worry about. Uh, it's the major source of pathogens, human or animal poop. Because now I have a siren because I'm in the city here in Philadelphia. Um, but urine and other bodily fluids can also be source, a source of pathogen, just as, it is, just as with humans. And bedding saturated with manure and urine is something to think about too. And also feathers, hides, blood, and saliva. Basically, the whole animal or the whole human can be a source of pathogens, as well as beneficial microorganisms. And the key, the thing you have to think about with animals is, how, is there any way that you're going to be creating a, a, um, a route for cross-contamination, either human hands, feet, and clothing, equipment that is dirty or is not cleaned properly, and then, of course, water, which is the most efficient vehicle for uh, transporting pathogens from one place to another. Is your irrigation water or your wash water uh, likely to become contaminated by um, sharing space with animals? Again, um, I, I'm, I've set this presentation up as, as a kind of the way I do risk assessments when I go to farms. What, what are the different questions that I ask? What are the different things that I bring up as I'm talking to farmers? And so I will, you'll notice as we go through that I, I pose a lot of questions that I may not have all the answers to. Food safety is really about the farmer doing a risk assessment of their own operation and then getting educated and, and, and kind of getting your intuition better informed about what is the best way to reduce risk on your operation. Everybody's a little different. So crops that grow closest to the ground are kind of uh, common sense, are gonna be more likely um, to be contaminated. Of course, anything can be contaminated by bird poop because they're flying. But in general, when you're talking about um, the most, most of the contamination outbreaks, food, foodborne illness outbreaks that have happened, it's mainly been with crops that grow close to the ground and of course with, with sprouts, where it's all about water. And then crops that are typically eaten raw are again higher risk. Obviously, you're not cooking them, so there's no kill step. So if you have contact with animals, just removing, just it's it's important to think about what you're wearing, and perhaps you need to be using protective clothing. Some maybe you put on an apron, maybe you have uh, a smock of some kind, maybe just have an overshirt that you wear when you go to work with the animals and you take that off before you go and work with produce again. You may or may not use gloves. 
I think washed hands are just as good as gloves. I, I hate to encourage people to use gloves that then go into the waste stream when you don't need to, but perhaps you feel that you need to, in which case you must wash your hands before you put the gloves on. This is something that because of COVID, people I think are a bit more aware of than they used to be. And then how are you storing things? This is a farm that I went to last year, beautifully stored. <laughs> Um, this obviously the photograph on the left is a much more effective way of storing protective sh gum boots or in New Zealand we call the gum boots uh, or farm work boots than the photograph on the right. So think about how you're storing the protective clothing that you may be wearing. Uh, one of the farms that I work with uses a foot bath and actually I have a standard operating procedure from that farm that I am going to share with you. Um, so he set up a protective foot bath for people to walk through when they come back from collecting eggs or feeding the chickens. Does everybody know that they have to wash their hands after they've handled it, worked with animals or handed an, handled any animal waste? <clears throat> Excuse me. Washing hands, washing hands, washing hands. We can't. Now I have someone letting up fireworks uh, in the neighborhood. Look, can you guys hear that? Sounds a bit like popcorn or hidden in the wall or something like that. It's probably louder for me than it is for you. Usually it doesn't happen until nighttime. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so yeah, can't emphasize the importance of washing hands enough. And uh, do you have a really convenient place for people to wash hands? If you need to, can you set up a portable hand washing station to make it really, really easy for people to wash their hands and make sure you have all the things in place, clean water, which needs to be free of detectable E. coli, um, soap, paper towels or single use towels, a trash can for the towels and a way to collect the wastewater from hand washing. Of course, you can have a, a plumbed hand washing system as well, but these are just examples of um, ways that people are making sure that hand washing is, is convenient. Another thing to think about is, are you sharing farm lanes with animals? Are you sharing um, equipment that may be used to work with animals or to move manure around? Um, is there a way to avoid sharing the, the equipment or sharing the farm lanes? That can be the toughest one. Or is, are you cleaning wheels and equipment and um, wagon beds and that kind of stuff before you use them to work with produce? So do you have some kind of procedure that is standard that everybody knows about? If you're sh using shared equipment, um, moving from working with animals and animal manure to working with produce. It's an important thing to think about. Farm lanes are a little bit trickier. I work with a lot of Amish folk in Pennsylvania, and of course they have, um, they're using horses and mules to pull vehicles. Um, so we have a lot of discussion about poop on the farm lanes. Um, there was one farmer who said he actually trained his horses to come out of the field, go to the side of the farm lane and poop there and not poop on the farm lane. Nobody actually believed him. But I believe them. I mean, maybe you can do that. Actually, one other farmer said it must be mules because you can train mules, but you can't train horses to do that. Anyway, it's something to be aware of and monitoring as you uh, go through your daily work. The other thing is, do you have dedicated equipment for working with animals and raw manure? If not, are you making sure that everything gets cleaned and sanitized between uses. And actually, I've used sanitized in here, but if something gets contaminated with manure, you may want to actually disinfect and not just sanitize. Um, actually, one of the things I can share, Sarah and Nev and Deb, is um, a, it's actually it's, yeah. I, there's a UVM, University of Vermont, has done a really nice fact sheet on the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting. That's something we could share in the toolkit. I'll do that later. Um, disinfecting is you can use pretty much use the same sanitizer, but it's a high strength and a longer contact time. So important to know the difference between, especially during COVID, to know the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting. Water sources, very important. Do you have animals standing around in your water source? Hopefully at this point you don't, and hopefully at this point, especially 
yeah, you have um, vegetative buffers or, or riparian barriers along waterways um, to help clean the water, uh, reduce the nutrient load, and prevent animals from getting in there. And also, if you have hydrants or wellheads, are they in pastures where animals can um, hang around them? Uh, I've been to a few farms where the wellhead's right in the pasture, and for some reason, it, they always, it always seems to be an area where water, standing water collects, and the cows like to stand and poop. So um, I always advise farmers to fence off the wellhead so that can't happen, because then you could have animal manure, the, the pathogens infiltrating into the well. You want to make sure that you've, your animals are fenced off effectively from crops. Uh, I think, uh, Brian and Jennifer, you talked about using guinea hens for um, pest control. It's something we might want to discuss a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask you that question during the question and answer. If animals do get into the crops and this applies to wildlife and livestock, what will you do? Do you have a system for flagging off where the manure or the, or the damage has occurred so that that part of the crop does not get harvested. That's one way to go about it. And just generally monitoring fields, you're doing it anyway to see how crops are going and to see if they're ready to harvest. Just pay attention to whether there's bird poop or deer poop or if an animal, you'll, obviously you will know if livestock has gotten into a crop that you didn't want them in. So you wanna, um, monitor that crop to see if there's any part of the harvest that you need to flag off so that it doesn't get harvested. Okay, if you, another, so uh, Brian and Jennifer talked a bit about waste um, and I actually added a little thing in there about not just compost, not just poop and manure, but also any other parts of the animals. So if you're using raw or incompletely composted manure, so when we'll talk about the difference, from animals on produce fields. Where is it located? Um, is there any risk from runoff into waterways, crops, farmlands, or farmyards? So I visited a farm and did, and did a risk assessment with the farmers in Maryland last year, and they were putting their uh, composting barn bedding alongside the farm lane on the upside, up, uphill side of the farm lane. And they just had never really thought about how that might be leaching down over the farm lane. And then actually across the, when it was raining hard, across the farm lane and into the crops on the other side. Um, same thing with, if you have a chicken tractor, is that ever alongside uh, an uphill from fields? that have uh, specialty crops growing in them? Do you, you have to just think that kind of thing through or is it right next to a farm lane at any time? Think that through. Is there a way to just move, not stop putting the chicken tractor right next to the farm lane, keep it up further away so there's some vegetative buffer between? If you're using livestock to clean up harvested fields after the harvest, uh, are, you use, are you thinking through any kind of interval before replanting and harvesting a ne the next crop? Maybe you want to use, if you're going to be planting that field with a high-risk crop like lettuce or spinach, maybe you um, put in a cover crop first for a while and then give, give it time for um, natural breaking down of the animal manure and um, killing off the path pathogens with UV light and desiccation and that kind of thing so that uh, there's time for the pathogens to actually be destroyed or some competition from beneficial microorganisms. Then there's the method for spreading manure. Um, obviously the picture in the middle is something that happens more on larger farms but there are a lot of farms here in Pennsylvania particularly uh, Amish farms where they're using manure spreaders with liquid manure and, and dry manure. And they have to think about what's the prevailing wind that day. Is, the na is their neighbor spreading manure right next to one of their strawberry field or something like that? Is there a way to prevent um, dust or from dry manure or liquid manure from getting onto sensitive crops? If you're doing it by hand or if you're using a smaller piece of machinery, Generally speaking, you can avoid uh, contaminating neighboring crops. 
So this is a beautiful uh, illustration from Wild Farm Alliance. And um, Wild Farm Alliance has some really great um, resources on looking at food safety and, and conservation and how the kind of co-management co of conservation and foods can actually be beneficial for food safety on the farm. I have the link to that in the last slide and um, Sarah uh, will be able to share that at the end. Um, this diagram in, one, in, in a couple of their publications kind of shows all the different ways that you might already have things in place to reduce risk uh, or, they may, or things to think about to reduce risk. Um, things like thinking about where you're placing crops. Are they uphill or downhill from any source of contamination from animals? Um, do you have windbreaks? Are you aware of the prevailing winds on your property? And therefore, that would help you to think about crop placement and also where you might need windbreaks. Um, you can use ditches and berms and vegetative buffers or ditches and berms to divert any runoff and uh, vegetative buffers to filter runoff. Obviously, fencing off livestock is something you would be doing, generally be doing anyway. I already talked about riparian barriers. Wetlands are a great way to, um, to uh, filter water before it gets into the main water source. And um, you guys talked about predators. Obviously, with chickens, you don't want to have raptors and other predators. With, with um, larger livestock or with no livestock, having predator habitat is actually really helpful to reduce vermin in the fields. So that's actually considered a great IPM, integrated pest management, for um, reducing wildlife, small wildlife. So if you are using raw manure, and this would apply to uh, other parts, other parts of the animal that are being composted as well, you can um, reduce risk by following the National Organic Program regulations, which is apply and work into the soil no less than two weeks before planting and at least 120 days before harvest where the crop touches the ground and 90 days before harvest where, it doesn't where the crop doesn't touch the ground. And this you could use if you're, getting, if you're looking to get GAP certified, you can use this uh, also. I'm running out of time here. So, if you do compost the manure, if you're using a passive treatment, you need to treat it as raw manure if you are trying to, if you have to comply with the produce safety rule or with GAP certification. And if you are using a scientifically valid treatment, such as, again, the National Organic Program requirements, then um, there are no restrictions on when you apply it, but you do need treatment records. And again, this would apply to composting of all animal parts. So bottom line, healthy soil is really important, as you all know. Rich Soil rich in, in diversity will increase competition with the pathogens. So just as with anything else about sustainable farming, biodiversity is really important, even for food safety. And then just quickly, I have um, borrowed Earth Spring Farm SOPs for chicken feeding and egg collection. Um, Lindsay, sorry to interrupt. Just wanted to let you know you actually you do actually have fifteen minutes. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I did, didn't know if you were aware of that. <laughs> I'm rushing right now. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, I was trying to figure out when we were ending, and I didn't didn't find it. So um, standard operating procedures that can be something that you have in your head, or it can be something that you write down. And if what I always say about standard operating procedures is if you want to grow your operation so that you aren't the one who has to know everything, then creating a standard operating procedure is really helpful because then you have something written down that somebody else can do. And um, I'm actually a chef by profession. I used to run commercial kitchens and um, it, it was a really big learning curve for me to write down my systems. But once I did, I was able to step away and do more marketing and sales and um, new menu and new recipe development and have other people do the work. And it was really helpful for me to write down my procedures. So um, Earth Spring, Mike Nolan from Earth Spring Farm wrote a really beautiful chicken feeding and egg collection SOP, uh, which I'm gonna share with you when, I, when I'm done with this. And uh, it just gives you an idea of Basically, you write down what you do. 
so that someone else can do it. And, you, and when you write it down, it also um, helps you to think through the process. So, and also, if you do have other people working with you, write it down and then check with them. Does this actually make sense? Is this actually practical? And get their input on how things are done so that when it comes down, when they, when they actually have to do it, they have bought into the standard operating procedure that you have created together. And then I have another one. Something to think about is that if you, are, have, if you have animals and you're processing chickens or you're collecting eggs or you're, um, uh, what am I saying? You're um, storing animal food of any kind on your farm, these are common allergens. So what are you gonna do if there is some kind of cross-contamination from a common allergen? So Mike Nolan again, created an SOP for what to do if his eggs break on or near produce because he's storing his eggs in the same cooler as he's storing produce. You know, smaller farm, he only has one cooler. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. You wanna segregate the eggs. You don't stack them on above any produce. And then if you do have a problem with egg breakage, you have a, a process or procedure here for how to handle it. So that is actually my presentation. Uh, I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna put the link for the chicken feeding and egg collecting SOP in the chat. I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, why are you not letting me do that? Okay, so I put the Earth Spring Farm SOPs in the chat. I'm also going to put the Wild Farm Alliance website, web page in the chat as well. I love the work that they have done. Um, it's really encouraging to read about how conservation actually works for you in terms of food safety and how much, as I said, how much biodiversity works for you in terms of food safety as well. It can be hard to convince some auditors of that. And so this is also a good place to say, you should read this before you come to my farm. <laughs> um, so can I start with a question for Brian and Jennifer? Can you talk about the guinea hens that you're using to manage pests? Um, this is our first year having a vegetable garden at this farm, um, and guinea hens. Um, and we do have poultry net around our vegetable garden because... They like to dust bathe in there. Yes, <laughs> they like to dust bathe in there. And, and we don't want our, we have turkeys too that are free range and we don't want our turkeys going in and eating our vegetables. Or stomping them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So they're fenced out. They, I mean, the guineas can fly. So it, it's not 100% that you can keep them out of the vegetables all the time. But there are plenty, but of, it birds, is, plenty of birds flying over your vegetables anyway. So. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> for us, just having them ra roaming through the pastures has been yeah. a huge improvement for us. On just The sheer number of ticks is down tremendously. Yeah. Um, and so they also seem to do a pretty good job on some of the other, um, I haven't seen as many, again, we don't have any, we don't have a baseline because this is the first year we have any, any kind of crops being done, but very few potato, um, Colorado potato beetles. Um, mm. um, I haven't seen very many cucumber beetles um, on any of the kirkabits yet. Um, I've seen some out in the pastures here and there, but but I think just in general, the the insect population seems to be very nicely balanced with with natives versus problematic um, insects. So, and yeah, there's I, only I, I, I just <laughs> love, I love the idea of having poultry um, help to manage pests. It just makes so much sense to me. And it sounds like you have done what you need to do to reduce the risk. So that's beautiful. There, there was a farm that I did a risk assessment at a couple of years ago where um, the, there was a deer fence around the produce field. Um, she had about 
one acre, so she, you know, was a smaller produce operation. But there was there was poultry of all kinds, free ranging all around that, and that meant that, and also roosting on top of the buildings Bands. that we used packing and use in the uh. greenhouse. And so uh, while the produce was, you know, the crops in the ground were protected, they were walking through bird poop to get to everything. And they um. were uh, storing things at the side of the little shed that they were packing in with a roof, you know, a sloping roof that the birds were roosting on that the you know, rain run off. So they just hadn't thought it through completely. Um, and it was just, I said, you know, you could just fence off the areas where you don't want them to go, including, you know, in addition to the fence. And of course, they could fly over the fence to get, but they didn't really fly over that fence. That mostly it was just wandering around all over the place, talking about, you know, all the footpaths were covered in boots. Yeah. So. But be, having specific boots is probably our biggest. We haven't weak done point. that. Yeah, and we should. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you, you slide into them and you, you just go all day. So we go out and we do yeah. the chickens and we do the pigs and we do the layers and the broilers and then we come back and okay, well now I, I'm going to pick some beans. Um, yeah. And so there's uh, definitely a weak point. Hand washing is an easy thing to remember after you've been handling well, sh shitty stuff. We're, we're washing our hands all the time and but, more so than ever now. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's true. Also, you 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 don't want to be cross contaminating animals with animals. You know, you don't right. you want them to stay healthy as well. Yeah. So hand washing tends to be much more. When you have dirty hands, you feel like from animals, you feel more like washing. But yeah, the 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 shoe thing is something definitely you want to think through and and think about where you can place them so that you automatically switch over. Mm -hmm. Um, would there be any other sort of tips of the trade? Uh, so like one of the advantages of this particular session is it's a lot of new people um, or people who are just starting off their operations and thinking about food safety on their farms now is a great, a great time to think through the standard operating procedures and just start off on the right foot with um, mapping things out. Like any other major things that you think should be on people's radars as they're, as they're starting? Um, I think going back to that Wild Farm Alliance diagram where you're looking at what are the prevailing winds, um, what's, what, where are you going to place crops versus animals so that you maximize risk reduction. So what can be uphill, what can be downhill, where are the waterways vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the animal placement as well. So it's really, it's great to think about these things before you even begin. And uh, yeah, are you sharing buildings? Like within a building, do you have animals housed at some part of the year and crop food handling in the same building? How are you preventing cross-contamination in that instance? Where are you storing um, equipment and machinery that is used to work with animals versus where you do food handling? So, um, thinking about your, uh, your workflow and how you may, you can prevent or reduce cross-contamination that way as well. And one other thing I was hoping you could elaborate on, so you were talking about the difference between um, disinfecting and sanitizing. Uh, mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind explaining that a little bit more for people, especially with um, equipment. Uh, Let me find that, um, I'm going to find a, a really great chart that Chris Callahan from UVM created. Hold on one second. One of the things that uh, this is also really relevant for COVID, actually. This is. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, All right. So, page four. Hmm, okay. Let me just make this bigger and flip it around. Rotate clockwise. Okay, I'm going to share my scoop. Oh, Escape that. 
I'm going to share my screen again. So this is a really great um, table that was that Chris Callahan created. So you can see that um, the same sanitizer, such as Ultra Clorox, brand or well, maybe we'll talk about sanitate since most of you are sustainable farmers, you might not want to use bleach or chlorine. So with Sanidate 5.0, which, you know, the, the active ingredients are peroxyacetic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Um, so there's the concentration for washing produce. There's the concentration for sanitizing hard surfaces and sanitizing reduces the level of pathogens to something that's considered safe for human health. Whereas disinfecting, which, and you can see, uh, one minute contact time in, in this instance for sanitizing. So if you were washing, scrubbing down your packing table, rinsing it off and then spraying it with a sanitate solution, it just needs to stay wet with that sanitizer solution for one minute. If you want to uh, actually disinfect that surface, um, you need to, this is a higher concentration. So this is point, 0.5 to 2.2 fluid ounces per gallon of water with a 10 minute contact time. So you might have to spray down that surface several times to make sure that it stays wet for 10 minutes, depending on how hot and dry it is when you do it. Um, so these are all fairly commonly used sanitizers that can be used for disinfecting. If you use Tsunami, it's not labeled for disinfecting, but it has the same active ingredients as pretty much about the same level as Vigorox. So you could probably use it the same way as Vigorox. Well, one thing I've heard you mention before is, is that this uh, sanitizer won't work if there are still particles, organic particles, right? So you have to clean something down first and then apply this, otherwise it's not as effective. Is right, exactly. So you can't sanitize dirt. So you need to sanitize a cleaned surface. So cleaning and sanitizing are two different things. Um, we were just at a farm last week where uh, they had ended up having an outbreak of listeria on butternut squash. And one of the problems, again, it was really hard to figure out exactly how the listeria got on the, on the product. But they, all they were doing to clean their um, packing line was spraying it with water with sanidate in it. They weren't actually getting in there with any soap and scrubbing it down. So um, this was a pretty a larger packing house for a, a, a co-op of Amish farmers. So they ended up getting a foamer and, and because it was hard to get into inside all the nooks and crannies of the packing line. So they got a, a backpack foamer and they sprayed soap foam on, in all the way around and let it sit for the prescribed amount of time. And that kind of lifts the dirt off and you rinse that off and then you spray with the water, uh, with the, sanit the solution of sanitizer and water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that to be an effective distinction for people to be keeping in mind, um, and that's relevant for COVID cleaning um, also. It is, yep. yeah. Well, it looks like we've actually reached uh, the end of our time. So uh, Lindsay, thank you so much for sharing some good food for thought for uh, food safety. And um, Jennifer and Brian, thanks again so much for sharing your pasture poultry operation with everybody. And I'll be sending a follow-up email that will have the updated budget of, you know, at some point and resources that were shared today. Um, I will uh, actually forgot to press record for the very beginning, but I have I have like 99.5% of, of the session. Um, so that will be available on the Future Harvest website, along with the slides from today. Um, thank you everybody for taking your time on this Sunday to um, share and learn and Sarah and Deb also thanks for your help. Um, so I guess that's it for now. Oh, and I, um, I'll just do a last plug for the, um, the two different surveys that we have. I'll, I'll send that in the follow-up email as well. It would be really helpful if you, if you take these two surveys. Uh, the first one is about this session today, along with like your feedback and thoughts on what types of sessions you would like to see moving forward. As we make our programming every year, 
we use your feedback to help decide what sort of sessions we create. So hearing from you would be really helpful to know what you would like to learn in the future. And, uh, and then also as climate, as um, COVID has, has hit and made it clear that our food system has a lot of vulnerabilities and a lot of kinks that need to be worked out to make sure in a crisis we can respond well. And small scale farmers have done a really great job of, of pivoting. Um, but what we're trying to use in this moment is an opportunity as funding is flying around uh, in the country to get funding to make our food system work uh, more effectively um, and profitably for smaller farmers and make sure that they're supported in this process. So the survey also is actually trying to get your input on what do you think would make your farm more successful and more profitable? Um, and what sort of support do we need to see our local officials um, give us right now? What sort of policy changes, um, infrastructure support, you know, whatever you think would make your, your farm uh, do better. Um, we want to hear what your thoughts are on that. So please do take the time to fill out this survey. And, um, and then also there's going to be just a question of food safety um, because this is, uh, it is a grant and you do have to, we, we have to do report back on grants to make sure that people um, are thinking about food safety since that's what we were funded to do. So um, thank you for taking the time to to share your thoughts on that as well. And that's about a wrap. So um, just stay tuned for that follow-up email and we'll be in touch moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs> nice note. <laughs> Bye, thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to head as well. Um, I love your shirt, by the way, Lindsay. Love the colors. <laughs> hey, um, I'm having trouble. Normally, I share the PowerPoint as a PDF.